is not the end game, the journey's where you are. You've never wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart. And the story isn't over, if the story isn't good. And failure's never final when the father's in the room. And failure's never final when the father's in the room. The space in between, those margins of life. And that's the theme of my message today. The power of pause, looking at the transitions in life. And I've been doing a series, remember John 10, 10, it says, Jesus came to give us life, life to the full. We are meant to live life to the full but not necessarily by filling our lives to the full, or we can actually not live our life to the full because we're filling it with the wrong things and not living our life to the full at all. And a few weeks ago, the part one, we looked at unplugging, how great our devices are, but also all the damage they can cause, and actually the importance of not missing life by being plugged into a device that uh, both spiritually and relationships and all the other things that can be impacted not necessarily because technology is wrong, but anything out of balance, anything that controls you rather than you controlling it can get us in trouble. So we looked at unplugging. Then last time, and it was a wonderful day, so it was a perfect opportunity, we looked at the importance of plugging in by getting outside. 90% of your life in this country, research says, is lived in an artificial environment, surrounded by plastics and faux leather and everything else with controlled climate that we don't get out enough, which is why the government, remember we said, prescribes vitamin D for all adults because we simply do not get enough. So that importance of actually spiritually as well as our own well-being. And I remember reminded you, God didn't create the palace of Eden. He created the garden of Eden. Get outside. So we looked at that. And today we're going to live life to the full by looking at the transitions in life, the power of pause, the space in between. Now, that's one thing we can miss in the Gospels. Because when we read the Gospel accounts, there's a lot of space in between. The unhurried times between the miracles. Jesus walking, for example, from one place to another. Very unhurried, not urgent. Even when he chose another mode of transport, he chose donkey power rather than horsepower. Hardly the Ferrari of the ancient world. And in fact, there's just a, one line of scripture here. John 1.43 says, The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. We wouldn't even pause at that point, would we? But those few words indicate several days in Jesus' life. That one line. 80 miles, four days with the disciples. Walking, talking, pausing, pondering, planning, and no doubt a lot of praying. But we largely fast forward those accounts to rush on to the next adventure in our lives. And we often live our life the same way. Now don't get me wrong, I'm sure between activities you don't have several days at a time just to pause or ponder or to reflect. If you do, then wow, you have a lot of space and time and I've got a lot of prayer requests for you. But actually, there is space in between, isn't there? The power of pausing, pausing to pray, to ponder, to prioritize, to plan. So often in our lives, we have more time than we think. But often we run from one engagement to the other, don't we? The next phone call, the next email, the next meeting. We're on the go. If we can actually eat our sandwich, stay on our phone and do cleaning at the same time, we're on a winner, aren't we? The other day, I noticed it again, I noticed it so often. Someone walking along with a bagel in the left hand, the phone in the right, straight into somebody else doing the same thing. Distracted by the device, trying to multitask, filling every conceivable space. Now, someone I've talked to about them before this, I'm not going to have eye contact with them because they got injured. <laughs> injured by doing that particular activity. 
but we're gracious people because I've done exactly the same thing myself, which is why I went into the sermon, but I didn't want to identify my own guilt, but hey-ho. But we seek to multitask, to fill every space. Sometimes we've had a painful email or read a painful message or heard something painful. And instead of pausing to ponder and to pray, we go straight into the next meeting. How effective are we going to be carrying that hurt and that pain as those words from the previous engagement ring through our heads? Momentarily, we think of Psalm 23 and we think, oh, what it would be like to lie down in green pastures, to be led by the Lord in quiet waters. Because if we're honest, we have our own version of Psalm 23 that goes more like this. The clock is my dictator. I shall not rest. It makes me lie down, but only when exhausted. It leads me into deep depression. It hounds my soul. It leads me in circles of frenzy for activity's sake. Even though I frantically move from task to task, I will never get it all done, for my ideal is with me. Deadlines and my need for approval, they drive me. They demand performance from me beyond the limits of my schedule. They anoint my head with migraines. My inbox overflows, and surely fatigue and time pressure shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the bonds of frustration and exhaustion forever. <laughs> That's in the RIV translation, the Ryan International Version of the Bible. But Jesus says, doesn't he, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But it just seems so impossible to attain. We can live our lives packed so full, yet really not be living our lives to the full. No room for the important things, little room for family, and often no room for God, and wonder why we end up frazzled and exhausted. Do you allow transitions in your life? Do you create space in between your activities, your meetings, your phone calls? Do you recognize the power of pause or do you rush from one activity to another? You know, week one, I talked about technology. Isn't, technology is awesome, isn't it? Technology is awesome. It's meant to make our lives easier. It was meant to make our lives so much easier we could live our lives to the full, having more time at home, more time with our family, and just to basically ease our existence with it all automated. But isn't the true opposite? It just creates frustration. It forces us to run. Hands up if you get frustrated when your computer seems to take a bit longer to load up than normal. How do you feel if you're honest when it says installing updates? <laughs> Aren't they of the devil? I'm like, installing up, why? I have an agenda here. Why doesn't the computer know I need it to load now? And then dodgy Wi-Fi. Oh, if that is definitely from the Prince of Lies, isn't it? I mean, gosh, dodgy Wi-Fi, outrageous. And then the one that clearly is the devil intervening. You send someone a message and they do not respond immediately. How can they not know that you have an agenda and a time scale and they should be replying now? Even if they are on a beach somewhere sipping a margarita, they should respond to your deadline. Instead of creating space, it just creates more demands. Anyone remember in the fabulous late 70s and 80s writing letters? Yay! All the young people said, what are those? But we loved it when emails were created because we didn't have to write letters. And they arrived straight away emails. No more postal problems. And then emails were a little bit too cumbersome, too slow. So then we thought text. We were marveled at text coming out because we could do abbreviated versions of emails. It saved us writing emails. And then there were emojis. You could make your texts even shorter. But still, there was the need for more time. So likes were created. You just have to click like on a post. You don't even have to respond to the person or communicate with them at all. We've arrived at the destination to avoid communication altogether. Like. My goodness. <laughs> Eliminating all transitions, hurrying from one thing to another. Anyone ever done a triathlon? Um, what put me off for life is I used to volunteer for the Lewis Triathlon. Not as a participant, as a marshal. 
And I'd sometimes be posted at the pool, sometimes the uh, cycling or sometimes the run. One time I was at the finish line, and that was it for me. I would never volunteer to take part in one. Some people looked like they were about to die. I used to be picking them up, giving the water, calling St. John's Ambulance. I don't know why they did it. And then you'd get the athletes that would come sailing through the professional athletes with a bead of sweat. Just one bead of sweat where they just wipe it away and say, can I go again? It put me off for life. Now, if you don't know what a triathlon is, a short triathlon is a 750-meter swim, a 20K cycle, and a 5K run. Now, for Marcia, that's not a problem. <laughs> However, for us, it may well be. Or there's the Ironman. You swim 2K, you cycle 90K, and then you run 21K. And there are more extreme versions of that. But the serious athletes take the transitions incredibly serious because they know they can win or lose on the transitions. What do I mean by that? The time from the water onto the bike. They set all their equipment up first to get there as quickly as possible from the water to the bike. And then from the bike to be able to run, to get off that bike, to get your running trainers on, they streamline knowing the shorter the transitions can be the difference between winning or losing or breaking their time. And the danger for us is we can live our lives that way. Try to eliminate all the transitions, all the space in between to be as efficient and fast as possible. Forget transitions and space in between, power of pause. We want to eliminate it. Is that in line with the Bible? Why did God create a whole day? Sabbath. Sundays. At one time in this country, it was a day of rest. A day when you would seek to always be together with your brothers and sisters in church, to connect with God and then with family. But now it's filled. Shops are open. Everything. All the activity. It was meant to be a transition from one week to the next. To unpack what happened in the last week and set you up for the week before. But we didn't have time. We just wanted to fast forward onto the next activity. We need to embrace the space in between the marvelous margins of life. Don't rush to fill these spaces or shorten them or remove them. Treasure them, cultivate them, create them in your life. How many of your phone calls would be different if you paused and you prayed before you made the phone call? If you paused and you prayed before putting down that post or sending that message? How many different things would be in your house if you paused before the purchase? Would you have that spiralizer or air fryer or bread maker? They're so big as well, aren't they? But the reviews seem so good at the time. And in a moment of madness in the sale, you buy it and it's delivered and it's so much bigger. My goodness. But isn't it easy, without those pauses and reflections, we learn from one thing to another. I haven't done it in this church, but in the previous church, um, I got the kids to do an activity where I got a tube of toothpaste and gave them some teaspoons and got them to squeeze out the toothpaste onto a teaspoon. And uh, they would do it quite well. Spilling a bit, but they would do it. I wouldn't do it here because it's carpeted. And then I'd say, that's excellent. Now put the toothpaste back in the tube. And you should have seen the mess then. Parents love me for doing that. It was everywhere except back in the tube. And the lesson being, in a moment, you can say or do something that's very easy to squeeze out, but incredibly difficult to undo. And sometimes a little bit of time up front takes an awful lot of time, effort, and energy trying to put it back in the tube, so to speak. The power of pause. Have you ever said this phrase when someone goes, why on earth did you do that? Or is that just my wife to me? Anyone has ever said that to you? Have you ever replied, I guess I just wasn't thinking? Hands up if you've ever said that. Oh, I'm in the right church. See, Tony, we're full of misfits here. The fact is we were thinking. We were just thinking about the wrong things. Not taking time to pause, to pray, to ponder before launching in. That space in between shapes everything else we do. A lot of what we do in church with the Lord, the Lord's mission for us very much is to develop our character, isn't it? To make us more like Christ. Developing character is like learning. It is learning. It takes time to build good habits. 
And back in the fabulous 80s, when we had bright coloured and long hair, and it was a wonderful time. Shoulder pads, yeah, knee-length socks, discos, and Frankie goes to Hollywood, and Duran Duran. Oh my goodness, I've gone time, I don't know where I am now. But remember, there was a guy called Cole who did something on learning cycle. That there's a stages, four stages you go through to learn something. Now, one of them you know, because we're all good at this, doing. Not all of you do things, but most of you do. Doing. That you try something out. But after you try it out, it's very important for the next stage to reflect. What just happened? How did that go? And after you've reflected, you draw conclusions. Now, I've reflected, what can I learn from what I just did or said? And I'll bring that into the planning stage before I do it next time. Four stages. And those stages were evident in people that developed healthy habits or learnt things. They may have a preference for any one, but they went through the cycle. The problem with us is we just do, 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 do. And if you do not reflect and if you do not conclude and you do not plan, you will simply repeat the same mistakes again and again and again. Which is why we go, I've known the Lord for many years, I'm still doing the same stuff. Are you learning? Are you putting things into action? Now, I know you're busy, but even a minute or two can make a difference. Even a minute or two. In fact, some of you I recommended the uh, one-minute pause from Johnny Elridge. There's an app when it's directed just for one minute, and there's a five-minute for the mega reflectors and a 10-minute for the crazy people who are so spiritual you can take 10 minutes out. But he did one minute because he figured that would be a big stretch for some people. One minute, and it certainly transformed his life. It's a one-minute uh, directed study. Now, you could do something yourself on your own. But one minute just to build in pauses. And many years ago, when I was working in London, I made the decision that I would put a pause in before every meeting, every phone call, every interaction. Consciously think about the Lord and pray between every transition. And it transformed nearly every conversation, every email, every interaction. I guaranteed I kept my calm in ways I wouldn't have done had I not have taken those short pauses just to get my mind and focus right. The power of the pause, even a short space of time. Build them into your day. In fact, John Eldridge in his book, Get Your Life Back, says this. Efficiency is often what drives us to remove all the margins from our lives, to fill every moment, and it's especially hard on relationships. Relationships suffer when we eradicate all the margins. Gerald May in his book, The Awkward Heart, says this. Efficiency efficiency is the how of life how we meet and handle the demands of daily living how we survive how we grow how we create how we deal with stress how effectively we are in our functional roles and activities in contrast love is the why of life why we are functioning at all what we want to be efficient for Love should come first. It should be the beginning of and the reason for everything. Efficiency should be the how. Love expresses its why. But it gets mixed up so easily. When I was a young parent, I wanted to take good care of my children. Efficiency. Because I cared so much for them. Love. But I soon became preoccupied with efficiency. What were my kids eating? Were they getting enough sleep? Would they be there on time? My concerns about efficiency began to eclipse the love they were meant to serve. Getting somewhere on time became more important than attending to a small fear or hurt feeling. Too often the report card, the preeminent symbol of childhood effectiveness and efficiency, was more significant than the hopes and fears of the little one that brought it home. Relationships. But you know what I would say? I think pausing makes us more efficient anyway. Far more efficient. Many of you may know the, uh, the famous analogy of the, uh, the young man with the saw, sawing wood. He sees this old man just across the way and thinks, I'll have a wager with him. I can saw more wood than he can in an hour. And he challenges the old man because he sees how slow he is. The man says, yeah, Absolutely. An hour passes and the young man's really confident because the old man is slow and he's even stopping. So he thinks, I'm going to smash this out of the park. At the end of it, when they count the wood, the old man's got 30% more wood cut than him. And he says, how on earth 
did you beat me? Look at you compared to me. He said, because I stopped to have a drink of water. And every time I stopped, I oiled the saw. So when I restarted, it cut far more efficiently. Far less activity, but using the transitions, which makes the actual doing more effective. It's not a waste of time. In fact, the time in between that seems a waste of time is the very time that will make what you do next more valuable time. Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am humble and gentle in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Waiting, resting, pausing, building in margins, need not take lots of time, but however much you do is not a waste of time. If you read a book without commas and colons and full stops and paragraphs and chapters, it would be a very difficult read. Those pauses that are built in help the narrative. They actually bring the story to life. They're not there slowing it down, they're there enhancing it. Music, the worship today, if there was no pauses between the notes, what would our songs be like? Or do the pauses add a richness that isn't there without them? For an athlete, they may win that race, they may win that gold medal, but usually you find they'll know it's significant to perform on the actual field of play as it is to rest and recharge and recuperate, that that is what causes them to have success when the starting gun goes off. How many marriages would have been saved if people would have paused and prayed and ponder? How different would many of your conversations and decisions be if you built space into your life? So how is your thought life? Are you more worried or peaceful? More negative or positive? More worldly or spiritual? Good indication. Would you describe yourself as peaceful, positive, spiritual, or worried, negative, and worldly? What does Paul say? Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. When do you think about such things? In the space in between in the margins. That's when you have space to think. Everything starts with a thought. The thought that you have will shape the words or actions you take. The words or actions you take, when regularly done, become habits. Habits shape your character. Your character shapes the direction you move in in your life and ultimately your destiny. But it starts with thoughts the transitions and the times in between to get your thoughts right are what will pay dividends later. And I'll finish with this. Many, many years ago when I was baptised and dinosaurs roamed the earth. <laughs> After I was baptised, there was a woman I didn't met before, but she had a picture when I came out of the baptistry. And she said she was in a rush, she was busy, but she said she paused and prayed and thought, I will wait, I will pause now before I go shopping to wait to get access to speak to this young man. And she said it was inconvenient, but she waited. And she came up to me and she said something. She said, when you came up from the baptistry, I had a picture of you in the pulpit. You'll be a minister and you'll lead a church. That was 18 years before 18 years of preparation before the Lord would let me loose doing that. <laughs> but because she took that time to pause and to pray, it was a seed in my life 
that without, I don't know whether I would have kept going. Val and I, in a busy time in our lives, when we were new Christians, took time to pause and pray between the busyness. And at that time of pausing and praying, you know the story, I won't go into detail, prompted us to put a Christmas card through a neighbor's letterbox that stopped him taking his life that moment. Because we built in time to pause and to pray and to ponder. But a very important thing, to act. Jesus always preached perfect sermons. Yet not all lives were transformed. Why? Because some didn't stop long enough to ponder, to think, and then to act. If you just go home and say, it's a nice message, Ryan, good series, I may get round to it, it won't make any difference. But if you seek to act when God speaks to you, that action is what will cause a difference in your life and the lives of those around you. So we're going to pause and ponder in a moment for you to actually focus on what the Lord is prompting you to do. After reflecting and concluding, you can then plan what you're going to do next time you act. And some of you here, you know you have tons and tons of time and space. You just haven't been using it in the right way. Maybe God's saying to you, come on, time and space isn't your problem. So just pause, ponder, and see what the Lord's saying to you. Father God, we've paused for merely two minutes. Not long, but sometimes it can seem a long time. Help us to cultivate those pauses, those transitions, to create space to unpack what we've just done before we go on to the next thing, to capture what you want to say to us in what we've just done, to learn from what we've just done, but also to be in the right place to move on to whatever is next, Lord. Even if it's small spaces, help us to cultivate and build these habits in, to intentionally build in space. And Lord, the very times when we are frustrated, when we're caught up in traffic or at an airport, when we're slowed down and it's inconvenient, rather than just get so angry and frustrated for whatever time it is, to recognize, Lord, there is a moment to pause, to ponder, to pray, to bring maybe those things that have been building up in our lives, to use that as a gift. A gift that, Lord, may not seem like a gift because it's been enforced in us, but you are in it, working for good. Help us to embrace those inconveniences. And, Lord, when we do, may you shape our very thoughts Therefore, in every activity we step into, in every conversation, Lord, we notice a different approach because we've learned to value and treasure the space in between. 
Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Feel free to sit or stand. Just let the Lord continue to speak to you. If faith could move the mountains, let the mountains move.
There's a table that you prepared for me in the presence of my enemy. It's your body and your blood you've shed for me. This is how I fight my battle. There's a table.
Just before I let uh, uh, Margaret uh, close the service, just had a word um, just to pass on. And uh, if there's some of you here, as someone here or listening online, watching online, is struggling with trust, to trust God as your heavenly Father, to actually trust Him. And uh, He is a loving heavenly Father. You can trust Him. Take that step of trust and receive what He has for you. And with each step that you take, you'll realize he can be trusted. So step out and trust your Heavenly Father. Yes, I think that um, reading that uh, Ryan read earlier actually is worth reading again. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So many people, I think, really seek rest, don't they? They feel life is just so busy. So let's take this on board today. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I'd actually read something in... Um, Lectio this week, which I was going to share, um, and it is a prayer. Holy Spirit, teach us to linger in your presence. Remind us that we were made to know and to be known by you. Allow us to recognize you wherever we are. My creator, the true light of the world. Father, we ask that we may be closer than ever to you this week in absolutely everything that we're doing. Lord, help us to pause and to ponder and to receive directly from you in every situation that we find ourselves. Amen. And do come forward for prayer if you would like prayer. And uh, I think there are going to be drinks. Are there of some kind? Yes, there are. So thank you very much. And um, we look forward to seeing you. We look forward to seeing you at the prayer meeting on Tuesday. <laughs> Not the end game.